Sleepy Sheepy here. Today we're going to be looking at a level 125 strength build utilizing the Grave Sight. So this is just a brief overview of what everything looks like if you want to pause the video, but we're going to go into further detail at the end of the video talking about the move set and the overall strategy of the build. But before we do that, let's go ahead and jump into the invasions, the arena content, and if you wouldn't mind considering subscribing, I definitely appreciate it. Alright, so jumping into our first invasion, we have a group of three in Stormvale Castle, and we have one opponent pulling me in with the Devourer, Scepter, Ash of War, and then another player going for Dragon Breath, so that's definitely the strategy they're going for, and I'm trying to bait them into those attacks and then run away before it hits. And then very quickly I'm able to stunlock my opponent and then roll catch them with Flaming Strike, and that combos into the follow-up heavy attack. So those three hits were enough to take care of one phantom, and now I'm in a slightly better position where I don't need to deal with that AoE that would pull me towards them, especially with the Rot Breath going on and the dual katana attack. So I'm trying to get a little bit more space for my opponents as well as bottleneck them a little bit so they can't just kind of pile up and spam attacks at me. So utilizing the staircase I think is pretty useful. However, the wall does cause me a little bit of issues. That's something you need to be aware of with the scythe is that the wide sweeping attack can catch the wall and negate the damage from the hit. So that happens only once, but I am able to take care of that other phantom, and now it's just a one-on-one -on -one with the host. And I do pull out my shield, which does have golden parry on it, at least for this invasion. And I'm thinking about going for a parry, but they're not playing predictably enough, and I don't feel that I can bait them successfully into one, so I'd rather just utilize the scythe, and at some point I switch back over to the two-handed moveset. But sometimes just the presence of a shield that can, you know, parry an opponent can just psych them out and having that psychological advantage that may change their play style a little bit can be a useful way to just get a little bit of an advantage and then here i go for a little bit of parkour and land a jumping attack for the last bit of hp so understanding that you can kind of cut corners in those moments can be really helpful just you know taking any space advantage that you can to either catch up to your opponent or run away from your opponent is a great way to just get a slight edge in invasions this next invasion is going to be a 2v1, and these are definitely some L2 enjoyers. We've got quite a bit of spam with the Storm Assault, or Storm Blade rather, and then we also have some Waves of Gold followed up by some Frost Breath. So definitely a duo that's looking to gank, and FP consumption is not too much of a concern of theirs. So I definitely need to regroup. I was pretty happy to not die there, especially with the desyncing Waves of Gold. And eventually I do get away, just get one heal off, but it turns out to be punished very quickly by the host. So here I go for just a, a quick turnaround while I heal. So that was useful. I knew that I'd probably get hit, but by turning around and walking forward, their jump attack went over my head. So that could be kind of useful. And here I'm able to get another jump attack just with a, a jumping heavy that hits the phantom here for quite a bit of damage and now they're about half health and when they go for their ash of war i go for a quick backstab on them so being able to just kind of take advantage of the slower ash of war animation and come in for a backstab especially being able to to play unlocked there i think that was particularly helpful because i could you know quickly strafe behind them and grab that backstab and then i'm able to shut down their dragon breath and you know is a, a little bit happy about that go for another jumping attack for quite a bit of damage now that i've got the ar buff associated with flaming strike and then just one more hit is enough to finish them off you'll also note that i got about a hundred thousand runes from the phantom so definitely an over leveled gank situation one that i was happy to come out on top from so next up we have what starts as a kind of a one-on-one -on -one. there will end up being three adversaries in the course of this particular invasion and we have another l2 enjoyer so they go for dynasty's finesse quite a few times kind of using it like it was bloodhound step or quick step just trying to maximize the number of iframes as they back off from me so i start delaying my attacks a little bit so that when they come out of dynasty's finesse it ends up being in my hitbox and i'm able to just grab a, a quick light attack or a crouch attack rather and that's something to mention with the scythe is that the crouch attack is very strong it comes out really quick and has not the most range but usually enough range to catch an opponent and it will be a great option so now it's me and the host who is actually a lot better than their armor would indicate so i frequently associate the whole radon setup 
with a player that doesn't really know what they're doing, but they did have some good roll catch timings. It wasn't too much of a factor yet, but we'll see as this blue gets summoned into the world, the pressure from the blue as well as the roll catch timing with the halberd was pretty successful on the part of the host. The blue was very aggressive here, so we'll see that I'm able to go for a poisonous mist and get the AR buff just from the poison proc. And here the host starts roll catching me pretty consistently. So I'm trying to roll into them and just kind of avoid that forward thrust animation that comes with a halberd poke. And then here the blue gets pretty greedy, starts going for a couple attacks out of stun lock, but I stay consistent with my attacks just because I have priority in that situation. And now it's just a one-on-one -on -one with the host and I'm able to go for a quick parry and weapon swap repost and they were playing pretty predictably with their pokes so their pokes were definitely well timed but that is a way to counter just kind of roll catch pokes if you do get a feel for their timing. Next up we have uh, 2v1 the host has jumped down so they can't reach me and the phantoms did not follow and I was able to utilize the iframes when I spawned in to get some quick damage on one of the phantoms and now we have another phantom here and they've pulled out a parry shield, so that's gonna be a little bit of a factor. I'm trying to avoid the giant's flame take thee, but do get hit with flaming strike. So I go for a quick heal just to kind of top things off. And here we can see that parry shield. So I go for a jumping attack because I don't wanna get parried and that does a fair bit of damage. And I've also pulled out my parry shield just for fun. And then here I was really happy about that moment where they went for a parry. I, at the very last second, unlocked and adjusted my angle and then was able to get a parry when they went for a flaming strike for a second time. And that follow up to flaming strike is very easy to parry just because the timing is very consistent. And then here I finally catch up with the host who's just kind of sitting around and I didn't want to drag it out too much. So I go into my inventory and just try to make it, a, you know, kind of a nice finish. So I switch over to a seal and put on a talisman that gives me a little bit of extra faith and just utilize the rejection <laughs> or uh, incantation rather. So totally unnecessary, but I feel like in a situation like that, using rejection is a fun way to finish things off. Next up, we have a 3v1 in the Brace of the Hallig Tree area, and I quickly get hit with some madness. I do go for Poisonous Mist and do poison one player, but I was too far away to get the AR buff. So switching over to either Flaming Strike or going for another Poisonous Mist just a little bit more close to my opponents is gonna be a good option. I also do need to worry about the madness buildup. So we have a player with Vike Spear as well as somebody with Marika's Hammer and the Marika's Hammer Ash of War can definitely kind of throw you up in the air and get you stuck in one place for a while. So if you get hit with that at the same time as some madness incantations, it can be pretty rough and just kind of result in a quick blender. And then the Marika's Hammer player goes for a prattling plate. I'm not 100% sure what that was about. And then they go for their Ash of War one more time and I'm just able to hit them out of the air with the scythe and then hit them once more with just a light attack. And that's one thing that's worth noting about the scythe is the neutral light attack is great as kind of an anti-air thing. So if you have people going for lots of jumping attacks against you, the scythe will often catch them out of the air, bring them down, and it will give you just a, a nice advantage where you can kind of cancel their attack. So it's pretty useful, especially if you have players that are using something like dual straight swords, it's gonna be a great example. If you can get the timing right, then you can catch them before they hit you with the jumping L1 that is very, very common for the dual straight swords play style. So I definitely like that. It's a good thing to be aware of. It takes a little while to get that timing down. And it's also just a little bit risky because if you don't get the timing correct, then you'll often, you know, just kind of eat a, a jumping attack, which is not ideal. But eventually I begin the chase down on the phantom there and they do roll off the stairs to their death so it's pretty happy about that and now it's just a one-on-one -on -one with the host so i go for poisonous mist another time hoping to get the ar buff it's also worth noting that i did try this on an occult build so you will see that the scythe is occult infused but i eventually ended up preferring the strength build i found that the blood loss build up was you know not super significant i wasn't really going for blood loss either it's a cold infused not bleed infused and i'm not using any um 
blood grease. So I definitely could have gone for more of a bleed route with this, but I thought poison was just a little bit more fun. And then going for something like the flame shrouding cracked here and flaming strike was a little bit more my play style. I don't love bleed and just kind of arcane builds in that sense. So the, the strength route was definitely preferred for my play style. So I was able to eventually kill that host with some help from the PVE, and that takes us to our next invasion with a player with the Vike Spear as well as the Tree Spear. And I have switched my Talisman, so I do have slightly more focus, which means that the Madness meter will be less likely to proc. I was able to get a backstab on the player with the dual great spears and when players go for something like a running L1 with dual great spears or even just a single great spear you'll often be in a good spot to just kind of roll into them, strafe around them and get a backstab. So I was able to get it once, I tried to go for it again but it was a little bit risky with the amount of health that I had so I just kind of adjusted my play style. The running L1 with Vike Spear is something definitely to worry about because you are going to take more madness build up in that kind of sequence than you know if they were just going for a single hit so if you get hit with all three of those different status procs then you'll be in a bit of a you know bad situation and then there i go for carrying retaliation just when they've started using their madness incantation i was actually able to carry in retaliation at that i wasn't aware of that but it ended up being pretty helpful because it stun locked them out of their madness buildup, and then i just go for a flaming strike that finishes off both of them Next up we have a what starts as a 2v1 and then turns into a 3v1 and I had a very hard time popping the bubble on the player with the curved sword and the axe but we also have another player with dual straight sword so definitely something to look out for but not a ton of damage from them. I'm not sure that they were totally optimized for PvP and I was able to tank more hits than you would normally be able to tank from a dual straight sword setup for somebody that you know really knows what they're doing and then a blue does kind of surprise me and come into the world so i kind of change my terrain i'm not sure if they're going to follow or not and it turns out just the blue follows and not the phantom of the host which is pretty nice and i'm able to get some good trades in and just kind of go for a little bit of the chase down here but not manage to hit them with the last hit i go for a quick estus punish but you will note that there are some projectiles coming my way from the phantom and the host above so i do need to be aware of that and i quickly go for a talisman swap just so i get a little bit more hp from the use of my crimson tears and then i'm really trying not to get stun locked from the projectiles as well as my opponent with the bloodhound fang so they are going for their ash of war a little bit i try to grab a backstab on the kind of backwards movement associated with the Bloodhound Fang, but eventually I'm able to get a guard break and that allows me a repost that does enough damage to you know, finish off that blue. So here I know that they're probably gonna try to go for some sneaky stuff as I go up this elevator. So this is something I'll frequently do if I know there are people waiting for me at the top is just at the very last second, jump down and get an idea of what type of attacks they're gonna be going for. And this is pretty useful because it wastes some of their FP and it also just means that when you go up for the third time they're probably thinking that you're just going to do it again because you've done it twice in a row and so you'll note that in this case it worked obviously it doesn't always work but they didn't get super aggressive with some type of you know zoning method that would be you know dragon breath or sort of night and flame that type of thing and then i'm also trying to avoid the incoming lightning attacks just with projectiles or rather just with objects in between me and that player i'm also trying to pop their bubble so again you can see how many fan daggers i throw at them and just none of them connect which was a little bit frustrating but finally we are able to grab that and then we hit the player with dual straight swords with flaming strike and that's enough to take care of them we now just have to deal with the host and they're not too much of an issue to deal with just on their own so I'm able to delay a crouching attack, which catches them and then go for another trade. And their hitbox was a little bit to the right, so I wasn't really prepared for that. But then I go for a quick unlocked attack and am able to catch them as they're running away. So again, the, the unlocked play I found to be very helpful. Next up we have a 2v1, and this is a group of gankers that are just kind of hanging out up here at the top of the ladder. And I need to be aware of that. I tried to bait them into whatever they were gonna do by just kind of faking things out a little bit and just try to get a feel for what's going on. I'm rolling a lot, trying not to get the 
full madness proc and death blight is actually now a factor which is pretty impressive it's usually not but when you're ganking at the top of a ladder i think it's pretty effective so my blight meter was pretty high and was a little bit worried about that the Fiasmus incantation is something that is, you know, <laughs> I've dabbled with it before in the past, and it's really helpful if you can get somebody stuck in a small space and go for it, but oftentimes Blight is pretty hard to, to land. So I've, you know, just kind of canceled all the different aspects of their damage and buildup. I've also changed my Talisman, so I'll be able to deal with more Madness buildup. And here I begin just kind of trying to bait them again. I go for a exalted flesh just to boost my ar a little bit and i'm not sure if i'll be able to kind of like bait them down the ladder sometimes that's something you can do as well where the animation that they go for especially if it has forward momentum will knock them down the elevator shaft or the kind of ladder shaft so that's something that you can do and i'm just trying not to take too much damage in the process or get madness build up obviously that would be not ideal and then at this point another red starts coming up the ladder and I definitely was appreciative of that, but they were a little bit more bold. I also go for Holy Ground in this moment just because I want a little bit of HP regen, and the red actually got the <laughs> host and the phantom to fall down the ladder. So I definitely appreciated that. They did their part to help out with that invasion, and even though they died in the process, it was nice to have a co-invader that at least could help out with that. So eventually the host does run over and resummon the phantom, Phantom. They kind of got away. I wasn't really sure where they were going and was kind of expecting them to come back up the ladder, so I felt it was prudent to kind of defend that area so I didn't have to deal with that. I give them a, a nice polite clap just to let them know that I really respect their playstyle and start going for some jumping attacks. I land one and try to get a nice delayed follow up, but at this point, the player with dual vikes has come back into the world. I double check that my clarifying horn charm is still in effect, which it is. I hadn't removed that, which, you know, I probably should have, but it ended up being useful as the second phantom just kind of respawned back into the world. And now I'm just trying to make sure that I don't lose this invasion. I've been uh, a little bit frustrated at this point by the playstyle. And here we have the players go back towards the ladder. So the host starts running up, but the phantom is going for more attacks with madness. I get a nice frost pot on the player with the bike spear and I think that I've kind of isolated them at this point, but the host does kind of play it smart and come down to protect their phantom. I land part of a Flaming Strike Ash of War there and then go for a backstab on the Vike Spear Ash of War, which is definitely a easier backstab to land. I grab a jumping attack, which kind of punishes their Estus, and then land just two more quick hits, get the crouch attack as a roll catch. And again, I just really like the crouch attack as a roll catch. I think it's pretty useful. And at this point, the host starts using some bubbles. So it's definitely fun to see. We have some lag from the red that comes in. They get hit with a bunch of stuff all at once, which was hard to deal with. But I do manage to finally catch up with the host and just finish them off. And was pretty happy about that because that particular play style and setup of just hanging out at the top of the ladder with uh, kind of AOE spam is, is not my favorite. I'd rather have just kind of a you know, group of people fighting in a space with melee weapons, but uh, you know, you can come out on top even with the Grave Scythe and a little bit of help from some co-invaders. So this next invasion is going to be one that lasted uh, a little bit longer than I wanted it to, and you can kind of get a feel for the play style of my opponents as well. I'm not sure how many times they sent that moon spell my way, but it seemed like way more than should be possible. We also have some ambush spells, so this is really just kind of a, a test of patience for the most part because if you do get hit by that type of stuff repeatedly you'll probably die and if you do get stun locked in one spot you know if you get hit with the moon and then there's that ar or that defense debuff that comes with getting hit with the moon so that happens at this point where you can see that kind of blue aura around my body means that i'll take more damage from spells and incantations so there i get hit with the ambush shard does quite a bit of damage and a blue has also come into the world and started using bolt of grand sacks so that just kind of was the uh, the cherry on top when it came to magical projectiles coming my way but i didn't want to give up so easily just kind of stuck with it and really tried to use the trees to my advantage because it's really hard to you know time your rolls for 
Bolt of Grand Sacks as well as a Moon, as well as maybe Stars of Ruin, just kind of simultaneously. So having some ki type of you know barrier between you and your opponents that are sending all these projectiles your way is going to be very helpful in terms of negating some of the incoming damage. So. I'm really trying not to roll too much. If I can strafe the majority of these things, I think it'll be helpful. And I also switch over to a thrusting sword with Bloodhound Step. So this is something that I usually pull out if, you know, there's a ton of spam and I really need to get out of somewhere with the Bloodhound Step Ash of War, or if I'm dealing with somebody with light roll or extremely passive play where I really need some chase down method that's going to be more effective than something like a scythe which isn't you know awful at chasing things down but having bloodhound step on something like a thrusting sword is going to be extremely powerful so we now start to see where all their stats went into it definitely wasn't vigor and we're able to just get two hits on the um, phantom there that was sending a lot of magic my way and I think they finally ran out of FP so that doesn't always happen in Elden Ring but when it does it's it's pretty nice feeling when you kind of force your opponent into using some melee weapons after they've sent like six moons your way so eventually we are kind of in a more melee style fight and that's definitely going to give me the advantage the amount of vigor investment will be more important for my build and you know it will be higher for my build and will be you know not so significant for the more like mage style builds so we do have to deal with a decent amount of spam from the the blue and they have a, a fair bit of vigor so that they're not fully you know invested in int or something they've spread their stats around a little bit more which is probably the more optimal way to play the game definitely recommend higher vigor especially at level 125 eventually we do hit them for around 1100 damage just with the flaming strike and follow-up and they're kind of backpedaling and they've run out of flask at that point or used the wrong flask and we can kind of start dealing with the fat rolling host that's just <laughs> sending out quite a few light attacks and i do have on the lower side of poise especially when it's uh, invasions at level 125 so having a little bit more poise would have been helpful and just kind of tanking some of these light attacks coming my way but I hit my opponent with Loretta Slash switch back over to Flaming Strike just because I see another blue has been summoned in and at this point I'm not sure that I have the resources to effectively deal with you know just kind of incoming chip damage and would rather just kind of go for the host and finish them off with Flaming Strike. All right, so moving into the duel portion of this showcase, we have a duel with Snapcaster. So if you're not familiar with who Snapcaster is, they're number two on the PlayStation ladder for kind of competitive PvP gameplay. And that's all part of a PvP Discord. If you don't care about that type of thing, that's totally fine. But it's kind of a long way of saying that they're a very good player. They're very well versed in just kind of dueling in one on one. And I was, you know, excited to have the opportunity to play them and also just, you know, got to see where this build kind of stacked up so we're both going for frost pots which i think is a useful way to get chip damage on your opponent and also means that the next attacks will be a little bit better i'm going for some unlocked play but do manage to get hit with a running attack with the cypher peta and die in the process but next up we do have another duel with snapcaster so this i was very happy about again like getting to replay somebody that's extremely good was awesome and we're both going for frost pots. I try to get poisonous mist in the mix. And I would say that the scythe is uh, one of the better counters to something like fist weapons like Cypher Peta, where it has a lot of quick range and the ability to stun lock regardless of poise. And here I get a pretty lucky moment where I hit them with a attack when they've blocked and I get the guard break. And they stay aggressive after that. It's often you'll see people who will kind of want to roll out and get out of that spot. And so when I went for a weapon swap, it was definitely the wrong move and probably should have appreciated just kind of the aggression that my opponent would show me since that's more of an advanced move than not. And I am able to hit them once more and then get a weird hitbox with Flaming Strike and just managed to come out on top against Snapcaster. So that was a really fun moment. I've played them a couple times since and things have not gone so well, but uh, a little bit of luck there and coming out on 
on top against a number two player was just kind of a, a good moment personally. They're definitely a better player than me overall, but uh, I wanted to include it there and just kind of message them afterwards to make sure it was cool. So next up we have another invasion, or rather uh, duel rather, and this is with Blade of Maya. Blade of Maya is an awesome streamer. You should definitely check them out if you haven't heard of them. And I spend a lot of time in their stream. So having a just kind of duel where they're using the uh, frost based scythe and I'm using the flaming strike scythe as well as I do have Loretta's Slash in the mix. So just kind of playing with them is a lot of fun. Um, I, you know, kind of go after them. They go for a nice talisman swap here, which is definitely the call. And I try to get some frost pots on them, just, you know, negating some of the damage negation that they have from their particular talismans and i hit them with a running attack and then i think surprise them with loretta slash so i was pretty happy to get a kill with loretta slash in the mix but you know blade of Maya is definitely a great player and you should check them out on stream if you haven't and then next up we have a player with uh, morgoth's curved sword and they've got kind of an interesting play style a lot of like starts and stops to the way they run around which can be kind of difficult to deal with it's a uh, a bit of an unpredictable movement style, one that I don't incorporate a ton, like I don't come to a full stop often, and it's a, a little bit weird to play against, so if you do encounter that, it's, it's something to look out for, and then I'm able to catch them just with Flaming Strike. They stay kind of aggressive and in my area rather than resetting back to neutral, and I'm able to hit them with another neutral attack. Next up, we have a player with dual halberds using the Guardian Tree Spear, and we do need to pay attention just with their ability to stunlock us very quickly with their their light attacks and their jumping attacks are definitely going to do a lot of damage too. I think they might have utilized the jumping attack just a, a little bit too much. It became a bit predictable towards the end and we could go for some of those neutral light attacks with the scythe which is going to be kind of an anti-air move. So having that as a, an option is going to be great and then we're also able to do some uh, just kind of turn and burn punishes to their jumping attacks where we space it and then either go for a roll catch attack or just kind of go for a running light or running heavy. And we do get some phantom hits. We don't get the full hit, but having the poison applied is going to be a nice element to getting those phantom hits. We know that they're more likely to kind of grab that poison than if we you know, weren't getting any hit at all. So kind of an advantage there, especially when you're dealing with somebody with a little bit of latency. And here we go for Poisonous Mist and do catch them, and then we switch over to our Flaming Strike, Ash of War. I definitely wasn't going for a backstab in that moment, but we got the animation. And then there I get stunlocked by the follow-up attack, so the dual halberd is uh, definitely a, a weird move set to deal with. And then there we go for an unlocked Flaming Strike and manage to catch them with the follow-up attack and then chase them down just a little bit more. If you made it this far, I just wanted to say thanks so much for watching, and if you just skipped ahead to see the build details, that's totally fine. Normally I put this at the beginning of the video, but because I think most people are looking for invasion content, I thought it made sense to at least try putting that earlier in the video. So if you have opinions about it, definitely let me know. But looking at the build, we're going to have 60 points into Vigor, 25 into Endurance, 69 into Strength, and 15 into Dexterity. We'll be using three different scythes, so that's going to have Flaming Strike, Loretta's Slash, and Poisonous Mist as the different Ashes of War. To boost those Ashes of War, we'll use Shard of Alexander. We'll also have the Claw Talisman, since the jump attacks are pretty strong on this build. We also have the Bulgoat Talisman to bring us to 71 poise. The Crimson Amber Medallion plus 2 to boost our HP. And then we'll be using the Blade Greaves, Royal Remain Gauntlets, and Hoslo's Armor. The Mushroom Crown is definitely flexible. If you don't plan on using the Poisonous Mist Ash of War, then I definitely recommend you know switching to something with maybe slightly better fashion, or just you know, something with higher poise is, is never a bad option. So that's the general setup here. And then we'll go ahead and talk about the strategy. So the ideal strategy that I use for this would be to use Poisonous Mist early on in the fight just because it procs poison pretty quickly so we can get the AR boost with that Ash of War and then switch our scythes over to something like Flaming Strike. That makes a lot of sense because we're also running the Flame Shrouding Cracked here as our mixed physics, so getting the AR buff with the Flame Shrouding Cracked here on our scythe as early as possible is definitely helpful. You'll also notice that I went for a lot more unlocked attacks or tried locking on at the last second, so the kind of moveset associated with the scythe is 
kind of wonky in terms of its hitbox, and I think we can use that to our advantage. Like, the backswing on a heavy attack really comes behind you, so you can use that to your advantage if you want it to be a little bit delayed, you can turn to one side, or if you want it to be a little bit early, you can turn to the other side. And that can just really throw off your opponent, make it a little bit harder for them to judge the timing, and you might be able to kind of get lucky and clip them with the weird hitbox of the scythe. So we'll be using that a lot. The jumping attacks are very strong. We're also boosting it with the claw talisman. And then we have stuff like the backstep attack, which honestly has a very vertical hitbox. So I don't love that attack, but it's not bad. And then flaming strike is just always going to be a great mix up. So having that ash of war on this weapon is very strong as well. I definitely enjoyed this and it was kind of a trial in terms of more unlocked play since I think that is a great way to just kind of increase your skill level and get used to playing a little bit more dynamically, a little bit less predictably. That's everything that I wanted to say about the build and the moveset. If you have any questions, definitely let me know in the comments. And if you have any recommendations for future builds, I'm always happy to take a look at those. But that's all I've got and I hope you have a good one.